Good evening. My name is Tom Giroux, and uh, thank you for attending tonight's webinar. Before we get started, I just wanted to familiar, familiarize you uh, with the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Uh, you can see our mission on the screen, which is to inform, educate, archive, and publish. Tonight, you'll be seeing our educational mission in action. However, I'd like to give you a couple of concrete examples on how we live out our mission every year. Every year we hold an annual conference and we publish the proceedings. We also offer attendance to our conference free to charge to school teachers. Uh, we have a partnership with UWSB and we hire interns to archive important information about Wisconsin's forest history. Again, uh, supporting our mission. Uh, if you uh, support this work that we do, I would encourage you to become a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Go to our uh, website and you'll see a button right on the front page to become a member. And, you know, it's tax season and perhaps uh, you'd like to get a tax deduction or maybe you have a required mandatory distribution. Um, please know that we are a 5013C corporation and uh, it's a charitable donation and we'd be glad to work with you on uh, getting that uh, uh, donation through. Uh, as always, when you're donating, you should consult with your tax advisor and your financial planner. So we're gonna get on with the program tonight. Uh, thanks for bearing with me on the little introduction. I think Don has some housekeeping members issues hey. to take care of though first. As Tom said, my name is Don Schnitzler. Uh, I am a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's Board of Directors. Uh, and I'm also the second half of the webinar committee. Tom is the first half. And tonight, I'd like to just say welcome to our first uh, webinar for 2024. Uh, to aid in the success of this webinar, a uh, couple things. First off, we'd like to have you use the chat feature, which is located in, on most computers uh, in the bottom of the screen. Use that chat feature should a question come up during the presentation that you would like relayed to our speaker later on in the presentation, at the end of the presentation. I'll relay the questions to Tom, and uh, he'll have a chance to answer them all then. If you're new to Zoom or have problems using Zoom tonight for any reason, uh, and you think it's something that I might be able to help with, use that same chat feature to reach out to me during the presentation and I'll see what I can do to get things working for you. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, there will be a brief survey, seven questions that pop up. We'd appreciate it if you would just take the time to answer those questions, and we'll use that information when we consider future webinars, uh, or if there's anything we should change, you could make that note there too. So this evening's presentation is one that I'm looking forward to hearing. It's searching census records for logging era relatives. Uh, lots of us have ancestors or relatives who worked in the logging camps in the heyday of logging in Wisconsin. And in tonight's program, uh, Tom is going to demonstrate how we can search some free record sources for online census information about logging camps and sawmills. Uh, we'll also look closely at a couple of logging operations to see the inner workings of what it took to run a mill and associated logging operation. And finally, he's going to demonstrate or show some links to pictures about logging operations. So it should be a really good webinar. Tom is uh, currently the vice president of the Forest History Association Board of Directors. Uh, he's a retired Department of Natural Resources uh, employee. He keeps busy working at a food pantry garden in Rhinelander on genealogy of his extensive family and volunteering as a city forester for the city of Rhinelander. And now I am pleased to turn the talk over to Tom and let him take it away. All right, thank you very much, John. Uh, one thing I wanna say tonight is that I need to turn on the chat function. I'm gonna do that one when I go out to the internet. So it'll be in a couple slides forward. I'll turn the chat function on, I uh, forgot to do that. So it'll be functioning here shortly. 
my goal tonight is not to turn you into a genealogist, but to give you some tools uh, in finding your ancestors and looking them up. If you happen to get excited about genealogy based on this and you want to delve deep deeper into it, that's a different webinar uh, for a different organization. So uh, we're just going to give you some really, really very basic tools uh, to look for your family. Uh, before I start uh, talking about that, I just wanted to pay homage to Joe Hermelin, who was a board uh, member of the Forest History Association, and he died uh, this past December. On the left there, you see Joe uh, archiving uh, some photos from the A.J. Kingsbury collection at the Lang Lake uh, County Historical Society. And he was living out our mission to archive materials. Uh, he was supposed to talk about those uh, photos tonight, and unfortunately, we don't have them. But his lit work lives on in those uh, archiving work he did for the Lang uh, Langley County uh, Historical Society. And he was just a special person to our board, and I wanted to recognize that. Um, we hope to find someone to speak about those photos. You'll see a couple of them tonight, but it's just really a teaser. Uh, so we're working with the uh, folks at the society uh, to find a replacement, but uh, he was a good guy. Okay, the objectives for tonight's talk. Um, we're gonna search existing genealogies for hints about your family tree. Chances are somebody's already been working on your family tree and you wouldn't have to do much. You can just borrow from them. Uh, we're gonna look for our other records that your relatives might left behind. Uh, and we're gonna browse those census records. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, sure, you can look up a census record for an individual, but I like to look into the communities, uh, particularly the logging communities and see and the only way to do that is go page by page through uh, the community where the census was taken. We'll show you how to browse census records. Uh, we're gonna look for information about specific locales and show you how to find those uh, that information for the locations. And then uh, we're gonna look a little bit at newspapers um, and see what kind of information you can find in old newspapers. And again, we're going to be concentrating on stuff that's free and available to everybody. And then, of course, the local historical societies are always a great source to look for information. So that's what we hope to accomplish tonight. Before we get into that, I just wanted to recognize that the Indigenous people of Wisconsin were uh, well in tuned with the forest, and they used forest products all the time. Uh, they used it uh, for, you know, making their canoes and their crafts, uh, their homes. They managed forests. They even used fire to manage forests uh, long before the Europeans came and invented uh, controlled burns. They were using burning to manage the forest and their food supply, actually. Uh, so I just wanted to recognize that. Uh, on the left there is one of those A.J. Kingsbury photos from Anago. He made postcards and he went across the north uh, taking pictures of all sorts of things. And he was at the Menominee uh, Reservation. And those are two Menominee uh, uh, Indians that worked in the logging era. Uh, speaking of uh, people who uh, from the Men Menominee Nation, Chief Oshkosh. And here you see a quote from uh, Chief Oshkosh. Uh, about harvesting timber. He says, start harvesting the trees with the rising sun and work towards the setting sun, but take only the mature trees, the sick trees, and the trees that have fallen. When you each reach the end of the reservation, turn around and cut from the setting sun to the rising sun, and the trees will last forever. Uh, I'm particularly proud that the Forest History Association of Wisconsin uh, uh, participated in the nomination process uh, to nominate uh, Chief Oshkosh uh, to the um, 
uh, Forestry Hall of Fame in uh, uh, Stevens Point. Uh, he will be inducted uh, later this fall. The other thing I wanted to say about this was that our annual meeting this year will be held and we will be focusing on the Menominee Nation and their forest and the history of that. So this is a bit of a teaser for our annual meeting coming up this October. We're in the pr process of planning it right now and we'd love to see you there. It's gonna be a really fascinating uh, program. The story of the Menominee is really, really unique and uh, we'll, we're hoping you can join us for that. All right, tonight we're gonna look at these three European uh, families and their work in the uh, uh, forest industry. The Grossman family on the far left is uh, part of uh, our president of the Forest History Association's family, John Grossman, and I'll talk about him first. Uh, Michael Grossman and his son, John. And then the Shire family right there, uh, those are part of my family. Uh, on the right hand is Catherine Boniface, uh, and she married uh, Dick Shire there, and we're gonna talk about that family a little bit. And the one on the far right is my uh, great-grandmother, Flora Jobert, who uh, uh, we'll talk about what she contributed to the uh, forestry uh, of the turn of the century. So let's start off with the Grossman family. Here's Mike Grossman. He came from Poland uh, in 1886 at the age of 21. And uh, they started out in Chicago. I understand he worked in the stockyards there, but then he moved to Eastern Oneida County and uh, started far farming there and sort of started a family. And uh, so this is John Grossman's uh, dad uh, on the right-hand side. So his name is also John Grossman. And uh, we're gonna take a look at uh, some information. Now, this all started because I saw a Facebook post from uh, uh, our president, John Grossman, uh, about his family and a little bit of his uh, story. And I knew that his dad, had worked in a logging camp that my family ran in the UP of Michigan in uh, 1920. Well, that happens to fall on a census year. And I thought I would look uh, for uh, John Grossman in the census to see if we could find out where he is. So we're gonna go out on the internet here. Uh, just a minute, if you give me a chance here. And it's uh, just loading, that's all that's happening. So here we are at Family Search. This is run by the Mormon Church in uh, Utah, and uh, it's a popular site. It's 100% free. Uh, the uh, genealogy and family history is an important and integral part of the Mormon faith. Uh, don't ask me to get too far in the weeds because I don't. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about that but I do know that it is really important. Family history is really important to their faith. And so they run this uh, free service for everybody, not just uh, members of the Mormon church. So the first thing I'm gonna teach you to do is to look for an already existing genealogy or family tree in uh, family search. So you go to this search button right here, you click on that, and it came up the dictionary spelling, that's all right. All right, so we're gonna look for a family tree. And when you get to the search part, right here, in, in, enter the information that you know about the person. Now, when you're looking for somebody on any uh, site, I always start with someone who's already passed away or dead. Uh, if you put a living person in there, much of the information is protected because they don't want people stealing identities like birth dates and stuff like that. So we're going to put Michael Grossman in there. I can spell. And then uh, we know where he lived. And this just has to be a place where they lived. 
We know he lived in the town of Sugar Camp. in Oneida County and it pops up down here. So you can just click on that and it'll fill it in. And then uh, you want a birth or death year. So from John Grossman's uh, Facebook post, mm -hmm. I saw he came in uh, 1886 and he was 21 years old. So that means his birth year was 1865. So this is just you enter the information you know about the person, and it's going to go out in its database and look for a family tree that matches that information. And it's the first one that comes up. You can see uh, because it has the death in sugar camp, comes from Poland, um, et cetera. Now, there, you might have to look for further down and go through all of these to find the right match. But this one right at the top of the page matches perfectly. And so we can start taking a look at that. And so everything is searchable, just a click of the mouse and it will take you to his page. If it is waiting for it to load. Um, now I always like to start by looking at the tree because uh, then you can uh, see all kinds of different things. So things are a little bit slow here. There we go. So there is a tree out there and you can see Michael Grossman here. And then um, I'm looking down here and I don't see uh, John Grossman. Well, it turns out if you click right here, Michael Grossman had another family after probably his wife died in 1894 there. And uh, there is Johann Grossman, which would be our John Grossman's uh, father. So let's take a look at that. And there's a, somebody's already put in a picture. All right. So one thing when you're looking at family trees, I was to look at the sources. Um, it's really important that uh, you look at the sources. Uh, and in family search, on the Mormon site, the family trees are much better, much more accurate, more documentation. Uh, the family trees on the commercial sites like Ancestry are not very good. So you always wanna make sure that the documents are matching people up and that their sources uh, to that they're relying on. And so uh, we're gonna click on the sources here and see what's out there. And so you see right away the census. And so here's 1920, when John's dad was supposedly working uh, in Marinesco, Michigan, uh, at the Boniface uh, lumber camps in the UP of Michigan, which would have been, I don't know, 50 or 60 miles away from Sugar Camp. And uh, let's take a look and see where John was. I keep getting the spelling there. Uh, so this is the transcribed portion of the census that's over on the right hand side here. And you can see that John is not listed in Marinesco, Michigan. He's listed actually in Oneida County in the town of Sugar Camp at the home farm. Does that mean he didn't work at the camp in Marinesco? Absolutely not. Many people, uh, particularly the farmers who worked at the lumber camps were recorded at their home farm. When the census worker came around, they talked to John's grandmother, Polly, and you know she just listed everybody who's same as the census is done right now. 
who lived there and you know her son was just off on a little uh, adventure in the UP. And so uh, not unusual. And I show this on purpose because I think a lot of you will run into this problem when you're looking for uh, family members in the census. They'll be listed at the home uh, where they reside for nine months out of the year, not uh, the logging camp where they were just there for a few months. Uh, so it gives all the particular information about him in Sugar Camp. Now, um, if you just give me a minute, I'm going to enable the chat here. If I can get to it. Okay, we're all done with that. Thanks for putting up with me. So next we're going to uh, look at the actual census. And I like to browse the census. And uh, so one thing about these links, I'm going to follow up with an email after tonight. And you have all the links. Don't worry about writing any of this down. You'll have an email tomorrow that will tell you how to exactly step by step to go to these links and do this. Uh, so don't worry too much about this, uh, the links. You'll get the links in a follow-up email. Uh, so this is the link to the census records. In family search again, totally free. All right, so they're listed here. And so we'll just do the same search we did uh, with that. And so right here is the 1920 census. The only reason it's red because I was there earlier today. All right, now you could enter John Grossman's name here and search, uh, but what I wanna do is browse through the census. Mm -hmm. And so you browse this and you look at it, it says 2 million. How are you gonna browse through 2 million documents? Well, I'll show you. All right, so the first thing you do is you pick your state. We're in Wisconsin, I think, right, John? And then all the counties come up. You pick your county. We know that we're looking in Oneida County. And then we're looking in the town of Sugar Camp. Now this is, you would think the census would come up right away, but no, you have to click on this district right here. All right, so here we are and you can blow it up here. Now, I uh, went through this census because it's really important, I think, to look through the entire thing and there's only 12 pages. And I already know that the Grossmans are on page eight. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of a shortcut here and go right to page eight. Oh, that's not good. There we go. And there we are. And I'm gonna blow it up so you can see the names. So you can see uh, Michael Grossman right here. It says line 70 uh, and his wife, Polly, Joseph, John. I'm not sure quite what name that is. Agnes, Cecilia, it's a daughter. Anyway, uh, so John is right here and we already know he's on this line. And there, there's something interesting I saw on this census I thought I'd point out and why you wanna look at the census, specific census record. Uh, so here you can see all of the heritage, Polish, Polish, Polish. There's a lot of Polish there. Uh, so you can see, uh, this is Michael up here and uh, General Farm. And this means that he owns the farm. 
but both Joseph and John, this is a W, it means that they were paid a wage. So I thought that was pretty unusual that Michael Grossman paid his sons uh, something to work on the farm, but he also uh, sent them off to Marinesco to work in the woods in the wintertime because he probably didn't need all of the uh, work in the you know a little slower winter time. So that's how to browse on family tree census records. And like I said, we'll see an example later on why it's important to look at the page before and the page after. Uh, so we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so I have a little bit more to say about the Grossman family. You know, they, like I said, uh, young John went out and uh, harvested trees in the wilds of the UP. But uh, later in life, uh, all farmers supplemented their income cutting pulp, particularly in the northern part of the state. Uh, so this was just a way, and this is, again, John Grossman, uh, John, our John Grossman's dad. And, uh, you know, it was a way to supplement the farm income was to cut pulp in the woods and you know there was a paper mill just you know 15 20 miles away uh in the city of rhinelander uh where he could market his pulp pulp wood and earn some extra income uh, it was just part of the farming uh tradition all right so now we're on to uh my relatives uh dick shire and then catherine boniface first thing i want to say when you're dealing with women always use the maiden name. Uh, if you don't know the maiden name, you can use the married name, uh, but the maiden name is listed in all the census documents, or not census documents, the vital records. So birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates, all have the maiden name. And so it's standard protocol when searching for women to look at the maiden name. But obviously, she was Mrs. Dickshire. Uh, this is their son. He's got an interesting story. Uh, when they were a young married couple, uh, he showed up at the train station uh, with a note pinned on his shirt. And he was maybe three or four years old, saying, son of Dickshire. And so it was not Catherine Boniface's son. It was his son from a previous relationship. So that was kind of an interesting story, just showed up on the doorstep. Uh, so, uh, oh, you know, I forgot to do something with the, oh yeah, we looked at the fan chart for the Grossmans. Uh, so this is the uh, fan chart for the Boniface family. Uh, this is my grandmother, actually, it's not Kate Boniface, but it's the, they were sisters, and so you'd have the same uh, fan chart. And so this is what I got off of uh, Family Search. And it's a little bit more extensive than the Gross Grossman family going to back to the 1700s. Uh, I had a relative that did a tremendous amount of research. Uh, actually, they did it before the internet, and they traveled to Europe and went through the church records in the basements of churches. Uh, so she did excellent work, and it's all well documented. All right, so here we are with the Boniface Shire family in 1930 census in the town of Presque Isle. Um, we would have called this, our family would have called this Weiniger. Uh, today it's Presque Isle, uh, and originally it was Fosterville. It's had all three names. It has Presque Isle, Fosterville, and uh, uh, Weiniger. Uh, so we would have called it Weiniger, though. Uh, so you can see the head here. Notice that they uh, rented, and it was $12 a month. Every town, house in town, even the house of the superintendent, uh, was rented. Everything was owned by the company. Um, you can see their ages here, 53 and 52. And the little guy in the picture before is 26. Here you can see immigration year. That's kind of important to know. And you can see he was the superintendent of the lumber company. And she was the postmistress. 
Now, um, this is an ancestry uh, uh, census record. And one reason I used it is because you can uh, look at things and have the uh, things show up here. But the other thing is I wanted to make a point about ancestry. You can also get at most libraries, uh, have a library edition of ancestry. So you can get at census records on ancestry also, in addition to family church. I always use both. Uh, they're kind of important. One thing that's nice about Ancestry, when I hovered over this and I took the screenshot, if you can't read the handwriting, you don't know what it is, you can hover on it and it will tell you the industry, U.S. Post Office, and she was the postmistress. And then little Dickie Shire, Shire was the clerk at the general store. So everybody worked uh, in, in the lumber uh, business. Uh, so remember, I told you to look um, elsewhere on adjacent pages. And so I found this Isaac Boniface. Well, I know Isaac Boniface is uh, uh, Catherine's uh, brother, or Kate, as I would call her. I am actually knew Kate Boniface, uh, and she was our Aunt Kate, uh, even though she was really our great Aunt Kate. Um, but uh, you can see Isaac here. I noticed right away. The census taker wrote down Germany. He didn't write down Luxembourg. Well, it's right nestled next to Germany and they probably spoke German. And so the census worker didn't write down Luxembourg uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and then something is not right with this uh, record here. They list an Elizabeth Boniface here. And uh, Isaac Boniface had nine sons, no daughters. Uh, and so, but I do know the family um, traded uh, children around. So they, you know, they, there's a large extended family. And so some children uh, would have been living with Isaac that maybe weren't, were his brothers or something like that. And so they didn't differentiate. And also if the two youngest here are four years old, right away what stuck out to me was that uh, Elizabeth Boniface was 58. Would she have had two twins or perhaps the two children that were months apart um, at 54 years old? I don't think that's very likely. So I think these three kids actually belong to a different Boniface. And, I just discovered this uh, an hour before the webinar, and so it's going to be some more research to find out whose kids those are. But uh, it's just one of those things that you find uh, when you're looking at census records. <clears throat> Notice uh, Isaac Boniface uh, is, they list him as a lumber mill and a sawmill, lumberman and sawmill as occupation. Uh, so you might wonder why, and he actually owned uh, Vilas County Lumber in Weiniger um, with his brother. Um, and so I, I found it interesting uh, that he was not the superintendent of the mill that his brother-in-law was. Well, I have an answer for that. Isaac Boniface had uh, no formal education whatsoever, was probably illiterate, and so he chose his brother-in-law to actually manage the mill. And uh, he was probably uh, managing, you know, some of the workers, workers and that kind of stuff. So it's just kind of interesting thing, things you can find if you look into the census records a little bit. All right. So this is Weininger in 1920. I had no relatives that lived in Weininger in 1920, but I thought this was really really an interesting census to take a really closer look at. First of all, the census taker was name was Matt Plunkett. The first thing I'd like to say about Matt, I'd like to give him a big hug because he printed and everything is completely legible. No trying to guess or anything like that. Second of all, he was very, very meticulous in recording people's uh, birthplace 
And uh, you can see uh, even he would put down Russian Poland, Russian Polish. So there's parts of Poland that were close to Russia. And a lot of people spoke Russian. And then there were uh, Polish that were closer to Germany. And then there were also the Pomeranians, uh, which were uh, another Polish uh, clan. And so he listed very detailed information about where people came from. And so I thought it was particularly interesting um, that he that you knew how, what kind of people lived and worked in these camps. So this is page two. Um, and so you can see you're actually in a lumber camp. You're out in the camp itself. And then uh, the occupations, he was very meticulous about writing down occupations. You go to most censuses, and it's going to say lumber camp laborer, lumber camp laborer, lumber camp laborer, or labor lumber camp. Uh, but he listed every occupation, cookie, barn boss, sawyer, barn man, teamster, hooker, uh, and the jammer, that's the lo the steam engine that loaded the logs onto the uh, train cars. This was during the hardwood era. Uh, so there were no log drives. The logs were taken out by rail. Um, I, there's a lot of teamsters and I was wondering why there was, but you still had to uh, skid the logs to the uh, rail line. And so they still needed a lot of uh, teamsters. But anyway, he's even got a host uh, engineer down here, hoist engineer. Engineers uh, in this period were people who worked on engines. Uh, so they had a lot of steam engines, uh, whether it was the trains or the mill equipment. And uh, so an engineer was the person who kept that steam engine running. So really meticulous. And so I went through this entire 20 some pages of the uh, census to uh, find out exactly how many people uh, worked in various parts. And I'm not quite done, but for mill jobs, uh, the there were a total of 174 mill jobs. Uh, just hold on a second, I got one thing I can take care of. The cat's banging on the door to get in the room. Sorry about that. So there's 174 uh, different jobs in the mill. But one thing that stuck out, and these are kind of in order. There were 26 just general laborers. But the, the next highest uh, number was a uh, lumber piler or piler. You just wrote piler down. And then there were 11 teamsters. There was eight lumber graders. I don't know what a resaw man is. Uh, and I don't know what a knee bolter is. So I've got to do some more strip, uh, work on this. I'm still in the progress, like I said, compiling like this. And then there were, you know, this, there was a sawmill, a shingle mill, and a lath mill all in the same place. Uh, and so you had a lot of different jobs. Uh, and uh, but I, I didn't know what a knee bolter was. So anybody want to pop that into the chat? I've got more research to do, I guess, of what I'm trying to say. But there were a ton, total of 174. But this number here, 19 uh, lumber pilers, kind of stuck out to me. And then down here we have the uh, lumber camp jobs. Whoops. Uh, so there were 44 teamsters, 32 saw, uh, sawyers, 25 loaders, uh, 25 uh, swampers. Swampers were kind of a general jack of trade, but they also built a lot of the roads and they iced the roads. 15 jammers, those are the people that loaded the logs on a tr from a tripod pulley system using a steam engine onto the rail cars. And there were 12 cooks, cookies, and second cooks. So that was kind of an interesting thing. So back to the pilers. This shows why there were 19 pilers. There was tremendous amount of lumber cut out of this. It was a hardwood mill. 
And uh, so they were constantly stacking and piling wood and it all dried outdoors in the sun. And uh, so that's why they needed uh, those pilers. Again, uh, this is an A.J. Kingsbury photo, uh, courtesy of the Langley County Historical Society. Um, and uh, you see the mill in the background here. This is the hot pond where they soak the logs uh, to get the bark off. And uh, so uh, I kind of uh, thought this poor lonely tree <laughs> sitting here uh, escaped all the harvesting and is gonna, uh, just thought it was interesting. But anyway, uh, that's why they had so many pilers. It was like I said, the second uh, uh, highest number of uh, employees in that work unit. All right, so now we're gonna work on Flora uh, Jobert. Uh, and so uh, one thing I, first thing I tried to do with this photo that I got from the Delta County Historical Society, uh, and that's what I wanted to say about photos. The way to get these photos is to actually visit the facilities. Uh, sometimes some of the historical societies have stuff on, line like the Lang Lake County Historical Society has the A.J. Kingsbury's photos online, uh, but not always. Um, so I was trying to figure out the date of this and I thought, well, Flora looks like she's maybe in her 60s here. Uh, and, but then I noticed the calendar over on the wall here underneath the deer head and so I had the art image sharpened and I was trying to read the year. I couldn't read the year, but then I noticed July or the 4th was highlighted and darkened. You can see the four if you blow it up and it's a darker color, which meant it was a holiday. And so I thought, okay, we know it's uh, on a Tuesday, July 4th. You can see it's a Tuesday. And so I figured out that it was either July 4th, 1916, or July 4th, 1922. If it would have been 1922, she would have been living in Escanaba or with their son. And so that narrowed it down to uh, 1916. And so I just uh, thought it was interesting. So we're gonna look at the census, I think next. Uh, so this is 1910 census, and you wanted to point out that what she's in, it says a home shop. She says she's the baker and she's a home shop. That to me doesn't look like a baker bakery to me. Now, I'm sure she did sell bakery from this bar, and this was another large logging town uh, in uh, Nama, Michigan, which is over by the Garden Peninsula. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder if she didn't offer the census taker a little drink to write down baker instead of uh, bar owner. Uh, and actually, you know, in talking to my dad, this was actually a pool hall. Uh, and actually, um, in the logging camps, they didn't play pool, they played English billiards. And Flora's son, uh, Frank Giroux, ran most of the billiard halls uh, across the Boniface uh, empire of different logging operations. Uh, so, and originally this was, uh, before her, uh, her husband passed away, it was a barber shop, but again, you would have been not unusual to sell alcohol at a barbershop. So just an uh, interesting thing that you can pick up off of the census. It says she's a baker and a home shop. Here's Flora's uh, fan chart. And I've got it two different ways. I've got Flora in the center here. And then I've got her husband, George, in the center here. And the first thing you notice is there's no ancestors beyond these two. And that's usually a sign that you have uh, some kind of what some genealogists call a brick wall, or you, you can't make the connections. 
And, uh, you know, I call it always a puzzle that just needs to be figured out. Uh, and so uh, one thing I did uh, to solve that we'll talk about in just a little bit, but it's both of them. There's no information on George, my great grandfather, and uh, no information about Flora beyond them. Uh, so um, one thing about these trees is they're all collaborative and that's how they build them. And that's why the trees at uh, Family Search are so much better than the trees at Ancestry is because people have to agree on things. And so nobody has yet agreed uh, that there's any uh, descendants beyond this point. Uh, so how did I find this? This is a uh, Julian Jobrier. Oh, I forgot I was gonna say one more thing about Flora. Notice that it's Jobert, not uh, Jobier. Um, spelling is uh, not all that important in all kinds of historical records, not just um, in uh, census records, but birth, death, etc. First of all, the script writing is sometimes hard to read. Is that an O? Is that a U? You know, is that an A? And so it gets transcribed differently. Uh, so um, don't always pay attention. It doesn't have to be spelled exactly is what I'm saying. What does match is all of this. We know this is all accurate and does match. And so uh, the spelling here is not all that important. Oh, so how did I find out that uh, this was my line? Well, I took a DNA test and my DNA says that I'm uh, related to this gentleman here, Julian Jobert. And so Julian uh, must be Flora's uh, uh, father. Um, and I just haven't found the record to prove that. Um, I have some ideas, and my current theory is that um, he had a uh, they had a teenage pregnancy, gave birth to uh, Flora, and then Julian went off to the Civil War, and I can see his Civil War records uh, on you know other research I've done, and never came back. He uh, went to Texas and never came back. And so that's my current theory, although uh, a genealogist always has to have records to confirm things. And so it's, I'm still working on it, but I do know this is my family line. One of the things I wanted to point out is how complete this is. Well, these were all French Canadians and uh, uh, from Quebec and Montreal specifically. And uh, so, and some of them were part of the original settlers of that area. And then, so it's much like the pilgrims. There's been a lot of research done. And so that's why you have uh, so much more complete. Again, the French people in Canada are very proud of their French heritage. And uh, so they actually put uh, government money and dollars into uh, uh, researching the ancestry of particularly those first uh, settlers, those pilgrims of the Quebec area. So that's why it's so extensive and so complete. All right, we're going to go to newspapers now. Look what I found on the Grossman family here. Looks like John Grossman's dad ran as a Republican for the uh, Oneida County Sheriff. Um, now, there's a possibility this isn't the right John Grossman, but you can see uh, it's, it looks right to me anyway. And this is August 11th, 1944. One thing I noticed right away was on August 15th, remember your feed man. Well, evidently, maybe John was uh, selling feed to farmers in the Sugar Camp area or across Oneida County, probably worked for a feed mill. and. Uh, uh, was running for our sheriff. Uh, but then the one thing I wanted to point out is just a week or two later, uh, John's uh, grandfather, Michael Grossman, died 
and I got to get rid of something here. I got to so I can see the whole screen. Uh, was so August twenty eighth, nineteen forty four. So maybe when we get to the Q and A, we can ask John uh, more specifics about his dad's run for uh, county sheriff and what happened, particularly since. Uh, it happened when at a time when his, uh, the family was in grief. So I, I just thought it was interesting. So we're gonna show you just really quickly, we're gonna go out to newspapers.com. Now newspapers is again, a paid service. So I promised you everything was free. Again, some or most libraries have uh, uh, the ability to use uh, newspaper researches. And some of them do have, uh, this particular search on their computers. Uh, so this is newspapers.com. And um, really all you have to do is uh, enter your name and a date range and a location and it should uh, come up with a, a story or two. Let's try somebody. And you can enter a range here. I'm going to iron enter. Ironwood, Michigan for the shire and see what we get. I, I really haven't even practiced this, so let's see what we get. I can, you know, doing this for so long, I can just tell you most of these are not coming up with uh, Richard Schreier. You don't see the Shire. Let's do something here. Let's take off. Oh, there's the reason why. Let's just do Shire. Now, this one I actually have a little later in the program, so we'll take a quick look at it. It was Dick Shire and D.M. Hansen uh, brought to Marinesco a boxing fight. So I thought that was uh, kind of interesting and brought a uh, boxing match out to uh, the Marinesco area. They were, this article is talking about how it was difficult to find somebody in a range of fight, uh, but uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. So that's the kind of thing you can find in newspapers. Uh, back to our presentation. Again, uh, most libraries uh, have the ability to search uh, newspapers on one of their computers. Uh, so Robert Boniface uh, would have been a son of Isaac Boniface. And so, you know, you oftentimes find uh, obituaries, but this one's a little bit more uh, detailed and tells about how Robert was crushed under the wheels of a logging truck. Um, and so it uh, doesn't sound like what he was doing was very safe. And, uh, and you can see uh, there he's uh, got, uh, his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Isaac Boniface, that we saw earlier on the uh, census record. Okay, so this is back to Dick Shire again. He was uh, arrested uh, July 1st, 1936. This was after Prohibition, but they were still selling moonshine in the North and avoiding the liquor tax. And you can see down here, uh, Richard was the third man arrested in the raid Monday and was given an alternative uh, 15 days in jail and paying a higher fine of 1650. Um, but this tells a story of uh, some uh, entrepreneurs uh, taking liquor across the state line in the waters meat area and uh, uh, selling it and uh, feds after him. So 
lots of neat stories about moonshining, uh, particularly in the Weiniger area. My dad uh, in Ironwood uh, delivered uh, moonshine in his papers, rolled up in his newspapers that he delivered to people's houses, would be a pint of liquor, again, tax-free. It was after prohibition but there was still a, a good market for cheap liquor. Uh, so this is Flora and her family. One thing you can always find, almost always find, are obituaries. They're pretty easy to find. And so you can see Flora uh, died at 73, uh, and um, George died quite young, 1905, 50-some years old. And oh, it says 60 there. And uh, so this is uh, sitting here on the left is my grandfather, Frank Jarrell. So you can always, almost always find obituaries and that's uh, interesting information. Okay, so I'm kind of at the end here. Um, and you might be wondering what does this last slide have to do uh, with uh, the Forest History Association. Well, my dad was a pilot and he flew over the ice bowl in 1967 when uh, Bart Starr did his famous quarterback sneak into the end zone. Uh, you know, at the time we lived in the Fox Valley and the games were blacked out so you couldn't watch them on TV. And so he jumped in his airplane and he flew over and took a picture of the ice bowl and I thought that was appropriate since the Packers are in a playoff games. And Don said that I was uh, a gardener and grow food. And every year I try my hand at growing a large pumpkin. So hence I've got the pumpkin on the right there for the Packers uh, go Pack go. So Don, I'm ready for questions. All right, then just a couple comments and then I'll get to the questions. Uh, when you uh, had the, the, the slide up there with the different jobs, uh, you asked the question about what resaw was and Karen Baumgartner uh, sends a note that the resaw is when a thick piece of lumber is cut into thinner pieces, resaw. Okay. And then the picture that you have up right now, uh, Sarah Connor uh, asked the question about if you have a date for that photograph. That's the one thing with the Kingsbury photos. Um, there are very few dates with them. Uh, and it's a little frustrating. Um, you know, we'd, we would have a rough date because it says Weininger. So the... Uh, and I am trying to dig it out of my brain here. Uh, it started out as Fosterville, then it changed to Weiniger, and then it changed to Presque Isle. Um, so I could I could get a range down. Uh, obviously, during the hardwood era, though, and they were hard at work uh, cutting hardwood, uh, mostly out of the UP, uh, but a little bit out of Isles County. Yeah, when it comes to dating photogra photographs and specifically postcards, it helps if they've been sent because uh, that way you'd have the cancellation on the back side, but that's not always foolproof. So, yeah, I mean, they, and you saw uh, Joe Hermelin, uh, they were off of negatives. Yeah, okay. So they wouldn't have the back side. All I had were the glass negatives. Uh, and I'm so grateful for Joe having done that because. Um, Mr. Kingsbury probably went to Weininger Fosterville dozens of times. And I don't know why he liked going there. Uh, you know, he went to a lot of places. I don't know how he did it back then either by train or by uh, Model A. I don't, I just don't know how he did it because he was all over the place. Uh, Mary Jurgatis, uh, is one of our, our participants regularly from the Milwaukee area. She wants to say that you are hired, Tom, to teach people how to use family search. You uh, actually, it's exactly what she does and you went through it just really well. Um, Again, I just wanna assure people, I wanna send out the links so that 
I mean, because you can wander around on Family Search for a while, and it's not, it's it's a good site and it's free, but it's not necessarily as intuitive. So I plan to send you the uh, directions for searching for your tree and searching the census records because it's it's uh, it, it takes a lot of clicking around to find it. Yeah. One thing I would add, because I do a lot of research on census records, is instead of looking for a person's name, if you're just looking for information about sawmills and logging camps and things, is put in a job and search for the job as yeah. a keyword rather than for an individual's name. And it will pull up those jobs if they were listed very specifically like uh, a Sawyer or a, a Teamster. You'll get those kinds of results instead of um, just just looking specifically for your family. Yeah. Uh, and then she also adds a comment uh, on at the bottom that if you have questions or need help finding information, the Family Search Center, and they're, and they're scattered throughout the state and lots of communities, uh, will be glad to help you find missing information. Absolutely, they're very helpful. And, you know, um, same with the local historical societies. You know, and the way I found those uh, 1920 uh, census records is I went to the little tiny historical society, I think it's Presque Isle Heritage Association. And I would drive through the town and it would be always closed. Every time I went through, it was always closed. And so finally I called somebody up there, the chamber or something, and I said, how do I, when is it open? And she says, well, I'll meet you over there. When are you coming? And so we went over and she let me in and I saw these census records. And then I said, I have to have more information. And that's what got me started on this journey. So, but they have really nice records there. Uh, and I, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to a small little, uh, historical societies and the information is great. And I'm sure Langlade has such great, a great building and such great stuff. I'm sure they're very helpful there. If you had anything in the central area or were interested, more interested in the Kingsbury photos. Like I said, we still hope to have a speaker on that. And as, as long as you mentioned, you know, records, um, Jennifer commented when you had shown the records from the French Canadians, uh, thank goodness or thank you for the French Canadian record keepers because they did do an outstanding job of documenting families from generation to generation. So if you have French Canadians, there's a good chance you can fill out a family tree like this fairly easily. Correct. And it, you know, I just, I don't, no other line that I've worked on is that complete. Um, and I also have a cousin who's done, gone even a little deeper than this, uh, but this is what's in uh, Family Search. And like I said, uh, they're so proud of their French Canadian heritage. They, the government provides a lot of help and in terms of uh, mapping it out. And, and John Grossman commented, again, you had asked the question about uh, if he knew whether or not his father or grandfather, was his father or grandfather? Uh, if he had run for sheriff, and John writes back, I did not know that he ran for sheriff, but he did own a feed store, so the your feed man uh, title there is, is appropriate. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And then, let's see here. Um... Do you have a, a date range for when Kingsbury took photos uh, in the lumber camps at, at all? He started about uh, 1900, maybe a little later, uh, through the 1920s, late 20s. Okay. And Mary, and actually uh, at the State Historical Society, there's an uh, directory of photographers and when they were in business in Wisconsin. Uh, I don't have the uh, link off the top of my head, but if you went and looked for historical photographers at the State Historical Society website, 
You could put in Kingsbury's name and it would give you the dates that he was in business and where he was taking pictures. We'll, uh, we'll add that link to, in the follow-up tomorrow. All right. I'll Good pull idea. it out for you. Because um, I'd be interested myself. I know Kingsbury wasn't the only one running around taking photos. It just so happened he went to Weiniger, like, uh, like I said, a, at least a half dozen times. Well, it's it's one of the sites that will help date a photo, and there are others. And so, uh, photos. If you have in a photo that's identified, whether it's Weaver or Colby or whoever, by knowing the photographer's name, you can get a little closer and putting the dates to it. Correct. Um, um, and then Sarah mentions that if there are German immigrant genealogy searches that you're looking for. University of Wisconsin, Max Cotty is uh, a good resource for that too. Yeah, there's almost every ethnic group has someone that's working on it. Uh, you know, I know that there's Norwegian, there's a Norwegian group. Uh, there's, uh, I mentioned Pomeranians. There's a big a group of Pomeranian researchers in Marathon County. Uh, and uh, so most ethnic groups have people that are doing work uh, and, you know, some kind of, uh, actually Luxembourg has a huge Luxembourg cultural center uh, in uh, Eastern Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of town. Maybe it's Luxembourg, Wisconsin. Uh, and it's quite an impressive place to go. A comment from John Grossman uh, complimenting you. Great job, Tom. I learned a lot and I think you helped a lot of people. So, and oh, there's more. Sheboygan County Historical Society has very good resources for genealogy and a researcher, Katie Riley, as well. Um, so, if anybody's down in the Sheboygan County area, that would be a good place to go. Um, another person commented about their ancestors being at Peshtigo. And Sarah again comments about the Kingsbury photos are also at the White Lake Historical Society over in Lang Lake County. Oh, yeah, they have spent a lot of time in Lang Lake. I uh, just allowed John Grossman to speak if he wants to say anything. This is just really outstanding. You know, I've, I've learned a lot in the course of the time we're here. Uh, I think I shared with both of you that uh, we had a meeting today with folks at uh, Kashina because we're planning the, the fall 2024 conference. And our friend Joe Hermelin was going to be a part of that. I'm looking at the, the slide you have up now of uh, from Langley County Historical Society. And we're in contact with these folks and they have expectation that we'll, we'll engage them and hopefully uh, uh, be able to, to slide into access to, to the resources Joe was going to offer us. There's so much here, friends, you know, that uh, that's our past. And, and so much of what we're involved in now as a society, you know, begs the question, where are we right now? Where are we right now that that is tied to how we got here, how we may have offended one another in our progress to getting where we are right now? What do we learn from that? How do we come together and proceed together to make the world a little better? You guys have done a great, great job of, of putting this together that reflects on our history, you know, how we collectively got to where we are, uh, individually and collectively. Neat, neat story, and and it it assigns high order purpose to what we're about and how we try to go forward. So, great job, all of you who put this together. Uh, I think we're going to capture more from from what we surfaced here tonight, and uh, find a way to go forward. So think about think about what we're going to try to do in October of this year. Honestly, I believe we're going to have to to assign some limits to who can participate in what's going on 
But what we put on as a program in October is going to be recorded. You know, our, our electronic uh, connection to the world is huge. It's huge. You know, we put up a new website in uh, 2019 and we've had 50,000 hits on it. So there's a, there's a huge world out there, bigger than Wisconsin, that connects to this story. And, and away we go. Away we go forward. Great job, all of you, for putting this together. I'm great, uh, grateful to have a, a chance to sit in on. Um, uh, yeah, I, I hope that my intent was just to provide a teaser for the forest, uh, for the annual meeting in Kashina. It's a really a much more in-depth story, the story of the Menominee. Yeah. Uh, so it, it it I'm really excited about this, and I uh, I'm going to be there, man. It's going to be a good one. And I think so too. It's such a special place. Where else in in Wisconsin can you you drive into it and automatically you feel like you're in a different place? Uh, Absolutely. It's a really different place. It can be seen from out of space. And the story of Menominee is, we've only just touched the edge of it here, so. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks guys. Outstanding job, really Any more questions, Don? Uh, a couple, lots of people saying thank you. So, uh, and great presentation. And I'll, I'll just echo that. Uh, great job, Tom. Uh, we will be converting this into a YouTube video tonight. It will be up on our YouTube channel. If you're looking for the YouTube channel, you can just go to YouTube and search for Forest History Association of Wisconsin. There are 85 videos there and they're all open for people to use and view. Hope you can find them. And at the end of this webinar, you'll get a little survey. Again, if you just take time to answer that, we'd appreciate it. Thanks much. Thank you. Thank you.